would you do if you had to start from square one in a new place with nothing but the shirt on your back? That's a question posed by a lot of media, but especially today's game, which puts it on the short list of places I wanted to visit on my continuing tour of the MMO genre. I'm curious to see what my own answer would be, so grab a drink and the nice chair, and put your feet up as we take a trip through Raven Dawn. Raven Dawn starts, as all MMOs do, with character creation. It's very limited here, with your character's appearance being determined by your archetype and gender. There are eight different archetypes that seem to cover the whole spread of your typical MMO roles, and it's been a while since I've played a rogue, so I'll choose Shadow. Once my character is named, we load into a server and wake up on our parents' farm, and at this point I've already started a countdown to when the plot is going to burn this place down. The game takes place from a top-down perspective that reminds me of footage I've seen of the old Ultima games. Movement's a bit on the stiff side, but that's nothing we can't adjust to. We're told to go grab a package from our neighbor, and it turns out to be a birthday gift. In my case, it was a pair of daggers. We get a chance to try these out when our dad decides to teach us how to fight by having us beat up the family scarecrow. Once we've sufficiently menaced an inanimate object, our mom asks us to go pick some strawberries. As far as tutorials for the basics of gameplay go, I've definitely seen a lot worse than this, and I do appreciate that it's woven into the story rather than just thrown at us with no context. With the strawberries picked, it's time for cake. And beetles, as the garden gets invaded just as we finish things up. It's a great chance to practice more of our combat, so we jump at the opportunity to drive them away. We haven't been given any abilities yet, but our auto attack is quick and more than enough to finish the job. Our dad gives us a bit more training once the beetles are taken care of, which gives us our first look at the skill tree. It looks like we'll be able to unlock up to two more archetypes once we level up a bit, which by my math, means that there are 92 different character builds. Or 84 if single archetype builds aren't viable, I'm honestly not sure. Either way, that's an insane amount of flexibility in playstyle. After we've gotten our first ability and destroyed the poor Scarecrow, we get one more gift. The compass from the Pirates of the Caribbean films, which honestly I think is a great way to explain quest markers in-universe. The first thing we need to do is use it to find our dog Bandit, which we find relaxing by the village gate with the guard. The man's been bored out of his skull, but he's got an important job, what with all the bandits around. And he also mentions the increasingly frequent earthquakes. As somebody who grew up in a very, shall we say, active area, yeah, I get it. Finding Bandit nets us our first level up, which means we need to allocate our stat points. I have no real idea what's good for my archetype, so I decide to lean into a balanced build, mostly into dexterity and might. That's almost certainly the wrong way to do this. If modern RPGs have taught me anything, it's that specialization is the only way to go. But I also don't want to get sent back to the respawn point any time a mage so much as looks at me. But with Bandit acquired, it's time to head home. And I can tell he's definitely my dog, because he has a tendency to stand on top of the nearest large object. With a sweeping overview of the village, we find out that this was all just a dream. The farmhouse is decrepit, and there doesn't seem to be anyone else home. Our character is a lot older, too, so I guess it's now several years later. We can change our hair and clothing color at will now, so I spend a bit of time finding a color combination I like, before finding out on top of everything else that's going on, Bandit can talk. It seems that the earthquakes have been getting especially strong recently, which means we need to leave as soon as possible. We gather some supplies for the journey, and Bandit finds a letter from Lucian Ravencrest, who was the ruler, or might still be the ruler, I'm not really clear on that. Reading the letter, we find out about his journey to find a new home, since ours is currently tearing itself apart. His search led him to the continent of Ravendon, where there's a new chance at life for anyone willing to make the voyage. With our own homeland dying, we've resolved to make the trip ourselves. I'm not sure if this is the actual plot of the game, or just set up for everything that's going to come after, but either way, this is certainly a compelling vacation pitch. Once we get all our supplies together, we decide to pick some flowers for our mom and dad. Making our way over toward the gate, we stop by the graveyard, where we find a genuinely tragic bit of environmental storytelling that shows exactly how devastating the years have been for the village. For as predictable as all this was, honestly, I still find it surprisingly effective. With no home left at our backs, we set out for the ship to Ravendon, and I seem to be cursed because no matter where I go, I get jumped by bandits. We make quick work of them, and soon enough we're setting sail. The curse continues with a fateful run-in with the Kraken that serves as a quick tutorial on AoE markers, but ultimately we're sunk. Sometime later, we wash up on the shore of Ravendon, just outside the slums that surround the main city. 
Fortunately, we're not the only one who survived, as Bandit washes up right next to us. Once we get our bearings, we're joined by a familiar face who made the trip over before I did. Just down the road, we meet a fisherman by the name of Fritz. He's a resident of the slums, and as luck would have it, he's got some work for a fresh castaway looking to get their bearings. The slums have a bit of a rat man problem that some goblins were hired to take care of, but given Fritz's shall we say, strong feelings on goblins, that just makes two problems he'd love for us to solve. We actually have a choice of how to respond here, with a level-headed order response that's aiming for the D&D &D lawful neutral view of rules over everything, the mercenary response that's fairly self-explanatory, and the killer response for when you really need that extra bit of edge. It doesn't seem to matter which you pick, they all unlock the same upgrades and feed into the same pool of points. But this might just be a system that's only relevant if I were here for a longer stay. I've certainly killed my share of Skaven, though, so we agree to help out with the rat problem. The slums are absolutely lousy with the things, so it takes us no time at all to finish. Returning to Fritz, he also tells us that most of the basements have them, so we head down and take care of them there, too. He says he can't afford to pay us for any more work, so I guess it's time to check in on that goblin thing that he mentioned. After fighting our way through an absolute horde of rat men, we run into Cheese Feet and Stab Face. We ask why they're refusing to leave, and surprise, surprise, Fritz wasn't being honest with us. It turns out that he's been withholding the goblins' pay for the rats they dealt with, so let's see if we can fix this. The pay is apparently being kept in his basement, which naturally has more rats in it, and once we find the sack of gold, we hand it over. Cheesefeet's surprised we dealt with him honestly, so we actually get paid for this job too. With two problems down, we move on to Brigda, who really wants some boar meat. She asks us to go outside of the slums and trap a boar for her using one of her traps. Honestly, these things are probably stronger than we are. I still actually have no idea if trapping is a mechanic after this quest. It never seemed to come up again, but Raven Dawn is a big place and I just might have missed it. Of course, Brigna can't eat raw meat, so we'll need to find a way to get it cooked. Unfortunately for us, the slums are a maze, and it takes us quite a while to find the one person with an oven. While we're wandering around, I hit level 7 and pick up my second archetype. I'm a huge sucker for poison builds, so I pick archery for my second one. After that, I decide to to take a quick break from searching to chop down some trees, which gives me a crash course in gathering. Hitting the green section on the bar speeds up the process dramatically, shaving down the time you need from 30 seconds to about 6 after a couple times. The 30 second base timer I imagine makes this hard to do while idle, but I guess if you wanted to zone out for a bit with a podcast, it's probably a fine thing to do. Eventually, we find Marcella, who volunteers to cook the boar meat for us. And I'm just going to assume that Raven Dawn is located somewhere near RuneScape, because she manages to burn the meat beyond edibility in mere seconds. She does feel bad about it, so she gives us some kebabs she made earlier to give to Brigda instead. Brigda isn't happy that the meat got burned, which for some reason we try to take responsibility for, even though we weren't the ones cooking, but she decides to pay us anyway. All in all, this is one of the stranger interactions I've had on my MMO journey. With our work in the slums done, it's time to head towards the city of Ravencrest proper. Because we're bad at reading maps, we missed that there's a gate connecting the city to the slums, but there's no harm in a quick jaunt through the countryside, right? On our way, we pass a winery that's being attacked by bandits. We jump in to help and manage to drive them off, netting us a nice reward and getting me a key for something that we won't be seeing for quite a while. We make it to the cathedral in the city and speak to Father Richard, who's more than happy to help us find our feet in this new land. He points us in the direction of the community farmland, as he needs some supplies and figures it'd be good for us to learn how things work here. The farm is run by the monk farmer, who appears to be some kind of chipmunk person. He gives us the rundown on how the farmland works and has us plant some potatoes and set up a pig pen. Normally these would both take about an hour to grow to the point where they could be harvested, but the farmer has a potion that grows them instantly. He gives us a trade pack to sell and tells us to see his cousin about crafting one for Father Richard. We head over to the harbor to sell the trade pack for a nice sum of silver, and the monk merchant also walks us through how to craft one of our own. It seems the best way to make money in Raven Dawn is to craft a pack in one town and take it somewhere with a better price to sell it. I normally really like these kind of mechanics, but the twist here is that carrying a trade pack removes PvP protection. I'm not exactly clear on whether 
whether that applies in every region or only the dangerous ones, but I'm allergic to open world PvP, so this won't be something I do much with on this trip. We head back to Father Richard, who's grateful for the materials. Mandy feels that we might want a bit more direction as we're getting our feet back under us. He points us to Jensen, a friend of the church who just so happens to run the winery we saved earlier. Jensen himself seems to have a pretty simple problem. His basement is overrun with bats, and he'd really like it not to be. That's simple work for a pair of travelers who've been on pest control duty more or less since we got here. The basement appears to connect to a wider network of tunnels, but the bats prove to be no issue. I do notice that the first archery skill appears to shoot an arrow, even though my character is not wielding a bow. No other evidence, I'm just gonna choose to believe my character is throwing the arrow at the enemies. With the bats dealt with, the next thing that he wants us to do is pour out some ale in memory of the dwarves who used to live in the ruins underneath the winery. That's a bit of a strange request but one we're more than happy to help out with. We press F to pay respects, and also find a key that Jensen lost nearby. With everything done, there's one last task for us. Jensen's friends with one of the dwarves who work in a nearby mine, and apparently things haven't been going well for them. He'd like us to take them a pack of wine to help brighten the foreman's spirits, and we don't really have anything else going on at the moment, so sure, why not? Heading east into the swamp, we find the mine Jensen told us about. Ugarum, the dwarf, is excited for the wine delivery, though he mostly just complains about how lazy his workers are. We volunteer to help out by mining the rest of the ore needed for the mine's next delivery, and handing it over to the guard at the gate. Mining works just like chopping trees, and a little bit later we have all the copper ore we need. Unfortunately, we need to pass through some spider-infested tunnels to get there, which is a bit of an issue. While we try to figure out how we're going to get through the tunnels, given half of our party has arachnophobia, a couple other other players run by. It's been nice seeing so many new people in the world alongside us. Eventually we figure out a way through, and we're able to make the delivery with no issues. Well, the gate guard was sleeping when we got there, but I'm not about to tell the foreman that. As thanks for getting the delivery together, Burgerum arranges for his craftsman to give us a crash course in making our own gear. I really like how things work here. You can get a marker for the nearest crafting station from the recipe page in your crafting menu, and whoever designed the crafting system clearly spent some time in Final Fantasy XIV because it works almost exactly the same way. I've always enjoyed the crafting in that game, so it is cool to see another game running with that same idea. A few clicks later and we have two new daggers, and while they don't do more damage than what I had been using, they can be infused. Infusion is a very simple system, I feel that the game explains poorly. I also found out the hard way there's nothing stopping you from accidentally infusing one weapon into another, so make that one new dagger, and now I look like a paladin. In a PvP-focused game like this, it's important to be able to tell at a glance what your opponent can do, and I do think that having your character's appearance tied to your weapon does help with that pretty cleanly. Our brief stay in the mines is done, so now our next step is to talk to Lieutenant Link. It seems things haven't gone well for him since he left Hyrule, as his entire unit has been wiped out by the pigmen we fought earlier. He asks us to go kill the bandit leaders to help deal with the problem, and since he decides to phrase it in a weird way, the order response has an, at least what I feel is an odd break in character over what is obviously the right thing to do. Instead, I decide to channel my inner edgelord and volunteer to march into the bandit camp and deal with the captains. The first of the camps is practically a mountain fortress. We fight our way through a handful of hook-masked bandits until we run into Captain Krug. Despite the game's insistence that this is going to be a tougher fight, he goes down quickly enough. We need his mask as proof of death, but it seems that he had a gold allergy and keeps the real one down in the basement somewhere. The lower levels of the camp are a sprawling maze of wooden structures and tunnels, but we manage to find the mask after a bit of searching. I also find a use for that key I got earlier, but something tells me I really shouldn't be here yet. On our way back, we still stumble into another random event, and decide to team up with those two players we keep running into. It's honestly a lot of fun tearing through a bunch of enemies with a couple random players, though I think my one big complaint so far is that nothing has even really scratched us. It's left this vacation feeling a little toothless in the challenge department. 
though that's one of those things that can always change without warning, so I probably shouldn't complain too much. Once we report back to Link, he gives us a look at what we can expect from the next camp, and the next captain that we need to take down. The place appears to be more of a ramshackle fort than a proper fortress, and fittingly, we're able to waltz right in and start a fight with Captain Boone. He puts up a bit more of a fight than Krug, though not much more, which just leaves the extra task of finding what's left of Link's unit. While we're looking around, we run across the Full Metal Alchemist. No relation. He's working on creating a Philosopher's Stone, and hands us some free potions when he mistakes my bolting for the door for agreeing to let him continue his work. We head into the lower levels of the camp, where we find a Private Ryan in need of saving. After we hand the key over so he can escape, it's time to return to Link. He's saddened by the loss of his unit, though relieved to hear at least one person made it out, and as a reward he gives us the materials to make some new armor. Each type of armor is made at a different kind of crafting station, which means I need to run back to Ravencrest for mine. But with a new piece of armor, it's time to head off to our next destination. The next stop is Maribel, who seems to be dealing with an outbreak of the undead. We agree to help by killing some of the skeletons that are roaming the nearby graveyard, and this is where we found out that enemy kills count no matter who did it, as long as you're close enough. After just a minute or two of running in circles, we managed to defeat enough skeletons for us to head back to Maribel. She now wants our help dealing with the Brotherhood bandits that took refuge in the local ruins. They seem to be the cause of all of this, and we'll need to take care of things before it becomes a real problem. Besides, if the Defias bandits came all this way to air a grievance after last time, I really should probably deal with it. The first step in stopping the undead is finding Father Earl, who's trapped somewhere in the ruins. Or at least that would be the first step if we didn't get immediately sidetracked by a flock of chickens. With no idea where the father is in the ruins, we run into our first Brotherhood enemies. Fortunately for me, they aren't the Defias back for revenge, but they do seem to be some kind of bandit nature cult, which I will admit is something I don't think I've ever seen before. Eventually we do find Father Earl at the top of one of the towers, and he confirms that the Brotherhood woke up some kind of ancient evil that's causing this whole mess. The first step to solving that problem is that we need to find ten soul orbs, which means more skeleton killing. This is another place where group kills counting comes in handy, as even with the orbs not being a guaranteed drop, it only takes a few minutes for us to get all the ones that we need. With the orbs in hand, Father Earl wants us to sacrifice them on the unholy altar. Uh, now, I may just be a simple tourist on a short visit, but isn't that what the bad guy would do? Father knows best, however, I guess, so off we go down to the altar. <laughs> that doesn't quite work, Father Earl wants us to use holy water to purify the prayer rooms in the ruins. We run a few laps around the place until we fill all of the water basins, fighting Brotherhood bandits the whole way. Of course, this also doesn't completely clean the ruins, so we'll need a new set of instructions. Also, I'd like to shout out the response most likely to be transplanted from a 2008 forum post. Next, Father Earl wants us to get the blessed herbs from the old cathedral dispensary to see if that fixes the issue. Yeah, that sounds about right. We find Denise the Cheat locked in the dispensary, and now I really want to know what she did to get that nickname. I figure she's been through enough, so I decide to let her go. With the herb in hand, Father Earl wants us to light it in the four eternal braziers scattered through the ruins. Apparently, there's a series of cracks that will allow the smoke to permeate the whole cathedral, and now I'm pretty sure they're doing this one on purpose. We catch back up with the other two players that are also working on this quest, and run through the tunnels to the braziers together. One of the two is using the spiritual archetype as their main, which has this cool shaman with a rapier thing going on that I didn't really expect to see, more than once at least. We get the last brazier lit, which means our next step is to head down to the room below the prison cells and... Hang on a minute. This... These ruins were a cathedral. Why does a cathedral have prison cells? Setting all that aside, we head down to the sacrificial altar. The room is bathed in the sickly green glow from the clearly evil braziers around the place, and lighting the candles summons a brotherhood warlock that we need to fight. I am now convinced that whatever we have just done was definitely evil. I mean, look at that skeleton. And once we get back to Father Earl, I'm going to confront him on it. Father Earl thanks us for our service and sends us on our way, and as much as I want to, there isn't any way for me to ask him about what we did down there, since this seems to be the end of the quest line. You know, if there turns out to be a late game quest where Father Earl is revealed to be some sort of necromancer, I will not be at all surprised. Our next quest giver is in the nearby Rona Woods, which which is especially notable because this will be our first experience with an open PvP zone. Or at least it would be if it weren't about to switch to peaceful in six minutes. 
we managed to track down Brumnar, who's nursing a hangover along with his entire unit, which means they won't be able to take on the Warhogs that live nearby. If nothing else, we've learned how to fight Warhogs at this point, so we volunteer to take them on in his place. He hands us a list of which ones we need to target, and we head out. The Warhog settlement is a large place, so it takes us a while to hunt down all of the things that we need to kill. There are also a lot more players here. If it weren't a PvP area, that wouldn't be an issue, but we decide to keep our distance in case they get any funny ideas. Some of these enemies even do some noticeable damage, though it's not the kind of thing that we can't heal from before the next fight. After several minutes of hunting, we find the last hoglet that we need and head back to Brumnar. His next job for us is to burn down several of their tents and supply wagons. It's extreme, but we've already seen how dangerous the hook mask bandits can be to anyone that isn't us. Hopefully this will prevent more of that. The things that we need to torch actually aren't instanced, which would be a problem if they didn't respond quickly. As it is, it just takes a bit of walking back and forth for us to get everything we need. Interestingly, the game remembers which ones you've already burned, so you can't just hit the same one over and over again. We head back to Brumnar once it's all taken care of, and now he wants us to take down the head hog and raise the dwarven flag on their main hill. Just a bit of salt to rub in the wound after all the other damage we've done. While we're on the way back to the camp, I notice that despite the amount of time that's passed, we still somehow have six minutes until it switches away from PvP. Also, pretty sure the hill we're heading towards is over where all the other players were, so hopefully nobody tries to pick a fight with us. At the hill where the hog leader is, we run back into our former companions. We give them some space while they fight their boss, and they even jump in to help us with ours, which is a really cool thing for them to do. With the main pig man slain, Brumnar gives us a chocobo egg and some material for new armor. We head back to Ravencrest, parting ways with our companions for the last time. Wherever Madoka Magica and Surveya Crystal are, I wish them the best of luck in their adventures. After crafting my new helmet, the egg hatches, and with our new seed and the whole of Raven Dawn spreading before us, unfortunately our time here has to come to an end. My time in Raven Dawn has left me in a bit of a strange place. It's the kind of game I could see being somebody's favorite MMO, especially if they haven't played a ton of others. With its excellent artistic style and broad customization options, I could easily see this being a game that younger me would have sunk hundreds of hours into, just the same way that I did RuneScape. In fact, if you're a fan of these kind of sandbox MMOs, I'd recommend this one just about as much as Ember's Adrift. But for my own personal preference. The game doesn't really deliver on the things that I come to MMOs for. The narrative hook of the destruction of Ladaria doesn't seem to matter at all once you've washed up on the main continent, and any of the momentum that the quests start building abruptly stops the moment you've gotten whatever reward they have for you. That's not to say I didn't enjoy my time. And if you play this game yourself, I'd love to hear what keeps you coming back in the comments. As for me, it's time to head off towards my next adventure. So until next time, may your ping and your Q times always be low.